Hello everyone, my name is Steve Jordans. Uh, I'm a professor of psychology from the University of Toronto Scarborough. It's my pleasure to be talking uh, to TMS again. I, we had a chat a while ago, but this chat is specifically about kids and kind of helping kids with some of the mental health challenges of COVID-19 and, and specifically the main one, which is anxiety. Uh, so what I really want to do in this talk, kind of briefly to set us up for our Q&A, is first of all, briefly talk about what anxiety is uh, and what it is your children are feeling. And I'm doing this as much because you might want to explain to them what it is. So I'm going to try to explain it in a way that your children could watch and, and hopefully understand. We'll see. I'm used to talking to 18 year olds. Let me see if I can do eight year olds. Um, I'll give it a go. Um, but also at the end, we'll have some strategies, some very clear strategies. And I think that'll kind of get everybody thinking a little bit. And then when we get together in the Q&A, we can take it wherever you want to take it. All right. So I'm going to be at a little bit of a quick pace because I want to make this about a 15 minute talk if I can. And that's the goal. All right. So here's where we start. Um, our brain and spinal cord, that's where a lot of the important decisions we make are made. But the brain and spinal cord then interact with the rest of the body, the muscles and the organs through something called the peripheral nervous system. What's critical about the system is that it's got two distinct modes of being. Um, one we sometimes colloquially call rest and digest. This is the mode we're usually in, but the other one is fight or flight. Uh, and it kicks in in certain situations. And these two modes are really kind of opposite. The anxiety is caused by the fight or flight. So in general, here's the story. When everything's fine in our world and we're just kind of relaxed, then our body is primarily focused on processes of digestion. Um, you know, the food that we've eaten, removing the nutrients from that food, from the waste, disposing of the waste, delivering the nutrients to the body, basically keeping our body strong. But if we ever feel there's suddenly a threat in our environment, something that could, um, you know, really seriously uh, potentially even kill us or at least harm us in a very significant way, our, our brain detects that threat really quickly and it triggers a whole different mode of being, the so-called fight or flight mode. So we leave the rest and digest. We move to the fight or flight and we almost become superhero versions of ourselves. When this fight or flight mode is kicked in, our breathing speeds up, our heart rate speeds up, we pump all this oxygen rich blood to all of our muscles. It makes our muscles really, really strong. We kind of shut down digestion. Digestion is not important right now. We, we need to be ready for action. We also see things like constrictions of the pupil. Generally, we become very aware of our external world. So, you know, think of some situation where maybe you heard a noise that scared you or, or something was going on in your house that really kind of freaked you out and had you worried. While well, you were probably in your fight or flight mode and it's called fight or flight mode because when we're in that situation, that's usually the two things on our mind. We're not thinking very deeply at that point. We're thinking, oh, there's something scary going on and am I going to go check it out and see what's going on and maybe fight whatever you know I find or am I going to get the heck out of here? Either way, I've got super strong muscles uh, because of all this oxygen rich blood. Uh, and so I can fight better than I ever could fight or I could flee better than I could ever flee. And really all we do is make that decision and then act. Okay, so let's just talk about this fight or flight system uh, because this is the source of a lot of the anxiety your children are feeling. Um, and, and so let's just talk about how that anxiety probably manifests itself. So first of all, I've already kind of given you a hint of this, but this should all make sense now. These are the noticeable effects, things that, that we might notice uh, if we were feeling anxiety or if somebody kind of looked at us in some cases and saw it. So things like pupils dilating, tunnel vision, we really zoom in on what the, that threat seems to be. We have this what's called sometimes hypervigilance of our surroundings. Um, we're kind of constantly scanning for the danger. Our breathing becomes fast and shallow. Our heart beat fast and we might even feel it. Um, we're sweating a little more. We have trouble sleeping because our body is ready for action, right? And we may have some of these sort of ADD or ADHD kind of symptoms where we're you know, constantly distracted. We have trouble focusing our attention at any point in time. We feel fidgety. We feel like we 
should be doing something, okay? And, you know, literally on the bodily level, what we're basically seeing is the muscles are getting all the strength and power and our digestive processes, excuse me, in general, are shutting down. So our mouth is getting dry and generally all of our digestive system is shutting down, okay? Now there's also other things that you wouldn't notice right off the bat, but are, there, are very important. So first of all, as part of the stress response, cortisol is released um, and the blood, uh, our blood pressure increases and our sugar increases and this all depresses our immune system. This is a problem, right? When we're anxious, our immune system isn't working as well. Um, we get this adrenaline released, which gives us that strength and power to fight and flee. Uh, our body is really, our, and our brain are really peaked for action. They want to do something. Uh, and so that gets in the way of sleep. And that's a problem because if, if you or your children are not sleeping well, that makes everything worse, okay? And yeah, digestion slows down. Uh, the nutrients and such aren't going to the muscles as well as they would. So this sort of long-term survival is being interfered with, okay? Now, these things are not necessarily bad um, as long as they're not going on too long. So here's the important point about this fight or flee system. It was meant to help us solve what we call acute emergencies or, or acute threats. So there's something suddenly happening. In this case, somebody's father got trapped under a car. And so she felt this, this fight or flight and she chose to fight. She was going to do something about this threat to her father's life. And she has all the strength in her muscles and she's able to lift up a BMW sedan uh, in order for her father to get out. This is something that, that she wouldn't normally be able to do if she just sort of tried. But when the fight or flight system is engaged, then you have that power and that's what it's there for. But critically, when you think this through the next step, she has that power, she lifts the car, the father escapes, and now she puts the car down and it's over, right? And that is what this system was evolved for. Situations where the threat shows up, you have to deal with it, fight it or flee it, um, but then it's done, it's over. You either fight it, you flee it, either way, in a few minutes, it's done and you can go back to that rest and digest, okay? So the fight or flee is meant to be a, a, a mode of being that just pops up to help us solve some immediate emergency and then disappears again. So those negative effects that it has don't last very long and they're worth it if they save our lives at the time. Okay, now here's the problem, especially with things like COVID. Um, and it's this difference between acute stress versus chronic stress. So this system, this fight or flee system evolved to deal with acute stress. You can kind of see it plotted over here. You know, some immediate danger to our existence that we have to deal with really quickly. Uh, and there's some examples of that over here. But in the modern world, very often the stresses, the threats that we feel are chronic. Okay, they don't just show up and go away. They could be things like a bad relationship, a stressful job, a toxic home environment. And in these cases, the stress is there every day. It doesn't go away. Now, of course, COVID is the ultimate chronic stress. It's been with us for over, well, almost a year. Uh, and it's been threatening our existence for almost a year. Uh, and that means that our fight or flight system and our children's fight or flight systems have been humming along um, for over a year. So, so you may have already noticed like sleep issues and maybe even digestive issues. You know, maybe maybe your children are actually feeling a little crampy and the, and the digestive system isn't working as well. That's a sign that they're feeling a stress, chronic stress uh, a lot of the time. Um, and you know, what we actually see if we look at the sort of cognitive and mental performance of people is a little bit of stress is okay. We actually, sometimes a little bit of stress puts us at our best. But if the stress goes on too long, or if it's too much, then over time, it wears us down. We become exhausted and our immune systems become compromised. We become more susceptible to things like a virus. So this is the real problem with something like COVID. It is a chronic, a continual 
source of anxiety. And if you or your children allow yourselves to be anxious, you know, continually, it's going to cause problems. And that's why we really need to think of ways to manage anxiety. Okay. So how do you manage anxiety? There's really two ways to do it. Um, there's one, and this is the one I'm going to focus mostly on today, managing anxiety by managing your environment. And then there's another way, a skills-based way, managing anxiety by learning to summon relaxation. I'm not going to talk much about that second one today. Uh, it may come up in Q&A and we can talk about it there. Um, but suffice it to say, relaxation is the obvious, uh, the obvious, the opposite of anxiety. So if you can learn to summon relaxation, you can kind of push out the anxiety. So it's a very powerful skill, but it's one you really need to learn. Okay. Whereas the, the environment approach is something you can start doing right after you hear this talk and you can have an immediate impact on the mental health of yourself and, and your children, your family in general. That's why I'm going to focus on this one today. Um, okay. So let's go there. Manage anxiety by managing your environment. And, you know, really when I say we'll start there, well, we're not going to start there. Well, we are. The biggest and most important part of your children's environment is you, okay? They watch you. They mimic you. We actually have in our brain um, something called mirror neurons where what you do, if, if your child watches you, they kind of feel those same actions in their brain. Their brain kind of mimics what your brain is doing when you're cooking, when you're shoveling snow, you know, whatever it may be. And so children imitate, and that's a very big part of their learning. When it comes to dealing with anxiety then, they're watching you, and they will resonate with your emotional state. Uh, and so what do you want them to feel? Probably things like this. This is what's important for kids, especially that second word early, safety, safe. They want to feel safe uh, and they feel safe when, when you seem like you feel safe. And what that generally means is you're calm. You feel like you're mimicking a sort of in control uh, state and you're empowered. We're going to talk about the importance of some of these uh, in, a, in a moment. But, you know, let's almost talk about the reverse for a second. Imagine the reverse we sometimes call neurotic. Imagine someone who's neurotic. What's a neurotic person? Well, they're constantly worrying about things. They're, they're like, oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. They don't look like they're in control. They look like the world is controlling them. They seem to be a victim of forces rather than, than somebody who's actually you know, making things happen. And if you're like that, if you're sort of modeling that sort of neurotic behavior, your child is going to feel that. Uh, and so you don't want them to. You want them to feel calm, safe, in control, and empowered. And therefore, you need to get there. You need to find a way to get there yourself. If you're not there, no matter what you do for your children, it's probably not going to work. It certainly won't work as well as it could if you first kind of get yourself to a good place. Okay. Now, a lot of the things I'm going to tell you will apply to yourself as well as your children. So really it's something, it's a journey you can take together. And so let's take these next steps now. Okay. You're going to get yourself together. How are you going to do that? Well, here are some ways in which the environment's important. And I'm going to start with just a, a, a well, really where we should all start which is the basics. Um, these don't take a whole lot of thought. These are just good ideas, um, especially good ideas when we're under a lot of stress, but good ideas in general. And they're things like this. Eat well. Uh, eat good, nutritious foods. This is no time for your, you or your children to have high sugar or high caffeine kinds of things. You're already, right? The fight or flight system is there. Don't feed it. Um, don't and, and you feed it when you feed it sugar and junk food and caffeine and other things that bring you up, right? Uh, and so try to get good nutritious food, eat you know good meals every day. Um, that's the start. Um, add in some aerobic activity. And so when we're thinking about your children here, you know, some sort of playtime, some sort of physical activity um, where they're moving and where their heart rate is elevated. You want as much of that as possible. Aerobic activity uh, has been shown to have positive impacts on mental health. 
we don't completely understand why, but we know 100% that it's true. Uh, so sneak in some aerobic activity. Very, very important. If your kids did sports before COVID, try to find some way of approximating that. Even if you can't do it in the you know, formal way that you had before, try to get them active in that way. It's, it's, it's absolutely critical for them. And then sleep. Um, sleep is, is key to everything when it comes to mental health. Um, if, if you're not sleeping well, everything else is going to be harder. So you really want to sleep well. Well, that sounds nice. How do we sleep well? Well, in fact, those first two help. Eating well and and uh, and look into you know when you eat. Sometimes things like having your big meal in the middle of the day and having a lighter meal in the evening can help people sleep better. Um, the exercise, of course, helps you sleep better. But I'm going to bring in another factor here that is a really critical critical factor, and and it's especially critical given you know kids are in school, they're out of school, things are changing all the time. You want to schedule. Our schedules, our set routines really give us a lot of, they are like, I sometimes call them rituals. They're like rituals we all go through that set us up for the day and, and get us, march us through the day, kind of keep our minds knowing where we are in time and space and what we're supposed to be doing. And that gives us a lot of sort of mental comfort. Uh, now in COVID, you know, sometimes your kids are going to school, sometimes they're not. There's the possibility they could wake up at different times, go to bed at different times. You don't want that. You really want to wake up at the same time, at least five days a week, you know, Monday through Friday, wake up at the same time, try to have lunch, your, your three meals at the same time, uh, make sure you're going to bed at the same time. But then throughout the day too, if you can structure learning with some aerobic activities, and I'm going to talk about some other activities you could structure in here. But if you have a, a set routine, then it's much easier for everybody to go to sleep. If, if your brain starts to know, oh, at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, um, that person goes to sleep. And if you do that consistently, then it will release the appropriate hormones and such when it's time for bed and you will find it easier to sleep. Um, so yeah, have that, have that schedule. Uh, keep it there at least five days a week. Yes, on the weekend, you can, you know, that's what makes weekends good. Um, but come Monday, get that schedule back in there. So this is the basics, okay. Now I just want to highlight a few other quick factors to keep in mind. There is no critter on this planet that is more social than we are. We need each other um, and we especially need each other during challenging times, um, times of fear, times of danger, times of grief, times of suffering. Um, our social connections are what ground us and, and keep us stable during those times. And so, yeah, COVID's made it tougher. You know, it's made it tougher for kids to kind of hang out and be kids like they should be, but they still need those social connections. And it's very important sometimes to find ways to bring those in. So I'm gonna suggest a couple things here that might spark questions in the Q&A. But one is a balance between physical health and mental health. And you see these two kids are skating outside with masks, let's assume they're outside. I assume it's an outdoor rink. If they were skating outdoors with masks on like this, even though they're not two meters apart, how much physical danger do you think there is there, especially given they're young kids and we know they're less prone to the disease in general? You know, I'm thinking there's not a whole lot of physical danger here. Um, masks outside, it, that those are two big things that stop the spread. Um, and um, there's a whole lot of mental health goodness going on there. These are friends being friends and feeling safe and trusted when they're together. Um, and so sometimes we need to kind of figure out those balances and, and how they work. We, we obviously want to keep the virus down, but we also want to think about the mental health. And if there are times when we can get a real mental health boom with very little cost on the physical health side, then we should be looking for those things. And I think outdoor activities, especially masked outdoor activities, are a good thing to think about that way. Uh, at least that's what I would argue. I also want to point out another thing about these social connections. They're as important to um, older people as they are to younger people. And in fact, at, during COVID, maybe even more important to older people because a lot of these older people are otherwise isolated. So remember when I said empowered, you know, you don't want your kids feeling like victims. Well, maybe adopt somebody in your neighborhood 
or in your you know community, however you define your community? Is there somebody there who would really appreciate your family calling and checking in on them every now and then, every couple of days, every three days? Hey, so we're gonna adopt this person. We're gonna connect with them and we can tell our children we're doing that for them. You know, that's gonna make a big deal to these people going through COVID. We're going to help these people get through this tough time. Um, and that notion that your child could be helping somebody else during this difficult time is empowering. You know, it's making the child uh, feel like they're doing something positive. And we all need that. I mean, I think I'm giving, I am giving these talks, I am doing those free courses because I feel the need to do something positive and I know it helps me. It, it'll help you, it'll help your children. So if there's ever places, and social connections is one place, but where you can find ways of, of allowing your children to have a positive impact during this time, grab them. Grab them for the impact, grab them for your children because it's helping your children as well. Okay. Now let's just talk about the environment very specifically. You know, I, I said things like your brain sees a bear and that puts you into fight or flight mode. You can kind of do the reverse too, right? The bear was out in the environment. Seeing the bear got it into your head and that put you into fight flight mode. Well, you can interact with the environment in other ways and it can affect what's on your mind. Let me, let me give you another negative. Let's start with CTV news, right? We all need to watch the news. Are schools open? Are they not open? So we're constantly watching the news for information that we need. But when we watch the news, we're essentially staring at the bear that is COVID. Uh, and if we keep watching the news, it's going to put our mind into a negative emotional state. Uh, and so we have to realize that. We have to understand that. And, and therefore, we should do things like budget our news intake. We should set specific times to get the information we need. But then we should get away from the TV because the TV is making us anxious. And instead, we should look for things that don't do that. And I'm going to you know, give you some, some especially mojo folk. By the way, anything that takes your mind off COVID is good. Okay, so if you have some activity that takes your mind off COVID and brings you to a better place, cool, great, use it, it's medicine. But there's other kinds of medicine that are especially powerful because they flood the body with endorphins, uh, which kind of counters those negative effects of anxiety. So specifically, singing, dancing, and using music in general. Okay, one of my favorite recommendations to families is that most of your smart TVs have a karaoke function built in. Have some karaoke nights with your family where you take turns singing, where you encourage dancing, where you encourage the next thing I'm going to talk about in a moment, laughing. Um, but you have music at the center, you got singing, you got dancing. That is a real good mental health break. You know, uh, forget taking some pills or whatever. Spend two hours doing karaoke and then check in with your family. You know, look at them, look at their look at their faces, look at what you think is in their minds, and what you'll see is happiness. What you'll see is contentment. What you'll see is safety. Um, so use those things um, as much as you can. And you know, I already highlighted this one, but also laughter. You know, great time for comedies if you, if if your family likes comedies. Um, there, there's there's things you can look at like laughter yoga, which is funny. There there are these sessions where people get together and they just start laughing. And if you just are around someone who laughs, you start to laugh too, and it feels so good and it does so many good things to you. So if you find things that make you or your family laugh, they are extremely valuable. Use those as well. Okay, and so laughing, singing, dancing, aerobic activities, all of these things, schedule them in your day. Remember that schedule? Schedule some of these things in now and then. Look forward to those social interactions that you're going to have. Look forward to that karaoke night, uh, etc. These are things that can really make your, your family feel together, feel strong, feel safe, um, and feel connected. Uh, and that's really important to your children uh, at this point in time. Okay, that's all I've got for you for now to kind of prompt the QA, but I do want to let you know that I have this free course on Coursera.org. 
Um, and if you search mind control, which sounds kind of creepy, but it actually means gaining control of your own mind, uh, you can get a, you know all of this that I told you in more detail, but also you'll learn a little bit about that relaxation approach as well, which could be useful. Uh, otherwise, again, I will be part of the Q&A for this. I look forward to that very much. So um, I will see you there. Um, bring your questions. Let's have a good chat. I, I, I know I know I always leave these sessions feeling good so so I look forward to it very much and I look forward to seeing all of you. Alrighty, bye bye.